Good afternoon. This is Across the Fence, and I'm Keith Silva. On October 16th, 1859, a small band of raiders led by John Brown attempted to capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. The U.S. Marines defeated the raiders, and Brown was sentenced to death. Our story today follows the body of John Brown from Virginia through Vermont to his home in North Elba, New York, and the John Brown Farm State Historic Site. Let's join historian Howard Coffin on the platform of the old train depot in Virgens. On a clear, cold morning in December 1859, with a new snow down on the Champlain Valley, a morning not unlike this one, the body of the abolitionist John Brown arrived at this railroad station in Virgins. Brown had been hanged three days previous in Charlestown, Virginia. Hanged after a court convicted him of crimes against the state of Virginia. Brown had attempted to start a slave uprising in Virginia, attempting to capture the Harper's Ferry Arsenal hoping that slaves would join him from nearby plantations. But a federal force led by Robert E. Lee and Jeb Stewart surrounded Brown's little fort in Harper's Ferry, and he went off wounded to jail. Brown had said to his jailer before he went to the gallows that he believed the crimes of this guilty land would never be purged away but with blood. Brown was right in thinking that his move against Harper's Ferry would eventually result in a civil war in America over slavery. And less than two years later, America was divided and at war over slavery and union. John Brown was one of the most famous men in the world by the time his body reached Virgins. People wanted to see the famous man, wanted to look at his face. Now, John Brown was pretty well known in Virgins. Many times he came across the lake to do his shopping here in Virgins. There weren't any stores on the New York side that had the goods he wanted because the railroad didn't go up that side of the lake. Local people said that uh, he was fond of children. He liked to talk with children along the streets. There's an unconfirmed uh, legend here in Virgins that he bought the rope here that was used to hang him, but I really don't think that is true. From here, the wagon went on down the hill and out to Panton to the ferry, the Adams Ferry, for the trip across the lake. And then they would go on up into the Adirondacks toward Lake Placid and the John Brown Farm. Brown stayed in North Elba till 1851, and then Brown took most of the family back to Ohio to help settle accounts with his business partner, Simon Perkins, when their wool business failed. Ruth, the eldest daughter, had married into the Thompson family, and Henry was the eldest Thompson. He was a carpenter, and Brown asked him to build a house here. So Brown comes back when? The spring of 1855. But as soon as he gets here, he gets word from his sons that they're being harassed by pro-slavery men in Kansas territory. And so uh, about 10 days after depositing his family here, he heads out to Kansas. How much was Brown here in North Elba from that time on? Well, from 55 to 59, he was here for about six or seven brief visits. He didn't expect to be away from the farm for so long, but uh, the fighting heated up in Kansas. He decided to keep the rest of his family here safe from any reprisals. While he was in Kansas, uh, he decided to go ahead with uh, his uh, plan to invade Virginia. The plan was postponed twice, so what he thought might be an 18-month uh, separation turned into almost five years. How did Brown feel about this farm? Is it a place that he loved? Had it been up to him, had there not been slavery, he would have just wanted to retire here. He loved the mountains. One of his last letters from prison, uh, he asked, he says, you know, how, how were the crops this year? What about the animals? Uh, you know, I, he, he did care about the farm, and uh, he, it was his last wish to be buried up here. His wife, on the other hand, didn't share the same love for the Adirondack Mountains. Back then, this was the middle of nowhere, and the winters were very long and hard. Here at the house, this was the last home that the family 
owned. And so it was uh, Mary Brown and the three youngest daughters here. And the older women, the daughters-in-law, would uh, uh, stay here from time to time. So it was basically a woman's farm, although they did have some, some male help close by. And it was tough going for the ladies, but this was an age when the men went off to war and the women uh, stayed at home. And the hardships that Mary Brown had to face while Brown was away, this was the sacrifice she could make because she was every bit the abolitionist John Brown was. We're in the parlor of the John Brown home, which I take it probably was the focus of Brown uh, family life. Now, there are, I believe, a lot of, or several, original pieces of furniture here. The only original pieces that we have to the house that when the Brown family were here are here in the parlor. The top of the writing desk and the bookcase were made by Henry Thompson, who, of course, made the house. These chairs are on the dining room table, and this rocking chair are also original to when the Browns were here. This has been a historic site since 1870, and things have come and gone, so uh, we know for a fact that these pieces belong to the Browns. Everything else you see throughout the house is either a period piece or a replica. Oh, I believe we're standing on original floorboards. Oh yes, the floorboards, you, you're t walking on the same floorboards that John Brown walked on as well. At the time of John Brown's funeral, I believe this room was half its size. There was a partition here, is that right? Yes, there was a wall dividing this into the parlor and the dining room. It was taken out during a restoration effort in the 1950s. We'd never think of doing that today, but they figured you'd just kind of uh, view the entire side of the house at one time. So this is a very, very small room in which to hold a funeral. Yes, uh, the immediate family was indoors. Uh, there was about 250 people outside, and the immediate family and some dignitaries in, in the, the parlor here. It was a very cold day, and Mary was exhausted from the trip back from Harper's Ferry. Now, as I understand it, it's a long funeral, and there's a long eulogy, is that right? Wendell Phillips, whom Brown had criticized in life for being all talk and no action, delivered a two hour plus eulogy. Uh, so he didn't disappoint there. Uh, but he does make the very famous statement that when uh, a, a storm has pulled up the roots of the tree, a tree has leaves, but it's essentially dead. Uh, Brown himself had pulled up the roots of the slave system, and uh, slavery still existed, but uh, the slave system itself was dead. Well, Brendan, we're in the kitchen of the John Brown uh, farmhouse, and I take it that this was pretty much the center of family life. Yes, the way you see the, the kitchen, of course, we can't have food cooking here and all that, but it would have been the center of, of any farmhouse. I guess today, wherever the TV would be the center of the house. But uh, the stove here, three meals a day were cooked here. There would have been a fire going all the time. Uh, the men of the house uh, spent most of their time outdoors, except when they were coming in to get something to eat, then going back out to their chores. There would be cooking and cleaning and washing and sewing, all sorts of activities going on. Now, I see a bed in the kitchen. Can you explain that? Yes, this is actually would have been a separate bedroom. This, I would say this was John and Mary's bedroom, but actually the Browns get here the first week of June of 1855, and then Brown immediately goes off to the fighting in Kansas. So we've come from the John Brown house to this uh, grave site. Now, John Brown was born in Connecticut. He lived for a time in Springfield, Massachusetts. He had several homes, but he wanted to be buried here. Is that right? Yes, that was his request. Uh, moments before his, uh, his execution, he dashed off a quick note to be given to his wife, and that was instructions to be buried by the big rock in the, uh, in the farmyard North Elba. John Brown is not the only person buried here, is he? No, for many years it was just Brown in the, the plot here. Later on, the bodies of his two sons that were killed in the raid and some of the, uh, the raiding party were, were eventually moved here. Now tell me about the gravestone. It's unique to the Brown family, I believe. Yes, it was actually his grandfather's stone. and His grandfather was a soldier in George Washington's army. Like many soldiers of that war, he died of disease rather than bullet wounds. In Manhattan, a few days after uh, Washington's defeat at the Battle of Long Island, so he was hastily buried somewhere in Manhattan, and a stone was put up in his memory in a small graveyard in Connecticut by his widow, Brown's grandmother. Brown found the stone laying against the wall uh, near the family's farm in Connecticut when he came through in 1857 on a speaking tour. He asked permission of his cousins to have it brought up here and have an inscription made for his son Frederick, who had died that previous summer at the Battle of Osawatomie in Kansas. So John Brown is buried by this great boulder and his name is carved atop of it. 
Tell us all about that. Well, just to start off with, no one's in the boulder or underneath it. Some people think that the rock, uh, that the monuments open up and there's uh, bones inside, like a mausoleum or something. That's not the case. It's a solid rock. For many years, this headstone was exposed to the elements. There was no protection around it. People were chipping away at the sides for a souvenir. So a, uh, a veteran of the Civil War, a colonel from a Massachusetts regiment by the name of Francis Lee, uh, came up here and he saw the, the headstone. He was afraid it would crumble away to nothing and no one knew where John Brown was buried. So he had a, a stone carver come out and carve John Brown 1859 to the rock, which he felt would be a more permanent monument. I was on the phone not long ago with a Southern historian and I mentioned that I was on my way to the John Brown farm and he said, that murderer, John Brown is a very controversial figure in American history. One of the reasons being that he and his sons uh, murdered uh, in the night uh, five pro-slavery settlers uh, out in Kansas. Uh, I sort of wish he hadn't done that. But uh, Brown is remarkable nonetheless. Herman Melville called him the meteor of the Civil War, and he probably is the prime cause of the Civil War, what got it going. Ralph Waldo Emerson says that Brown made of the gallows what Jesus Christ made of the cross. He was a great fan of John Brown's. I will never forget the first time I came to the John Brown farm. It was a January night. It was 20 below. I came out here and it was clear as could be. The stars were shining. I stood right here behind this statue of Brown in conversation with a young black boy. I walked around behind it. I was looking north and there above it was the Big Dipper, the drinking gourd that slaves were taught to follow as they moved north to freedom. John Brown had an awful lot to do with setting free a race of people here in the United States of America. The John Brown State Historic Site is open until the end of October. Go to their website for more information, including hours of operation and directions. Admission to the Historic House is free. If you've enjoyed today's program and you'd like to watch past programs, visit us on our social media channels on YouTube and Facebook by searching Across the Fence. Take care.